five. Hooray! It's Bonnie Gillespie. You are tuned in for day five of our SMF May Self-Management for Actors 20th anniversary of all the good advice coming in from yours truly for 20 years. We're going to do 20 days in the month of May. Today is day five. If you could do me a favor and let me know you're here. I know Instagram is up and running. That makes me super happy. I would love to see some Facebook, some YouTube, some Periscope, just so I know that it's actually landing everywhere. We had a little glitch uh, on our fourth day broadcast where it didn't push through to Facebook. Apparently, Facebook changed something about the API with Restream, and allegedly it's all fixed now, but the comments might not show up. I don't know, but hopefully we're going to have everything landing. Uh, so far, I see so I see some Facebook comments from April and Carlos and Bradley. I see Dean at YouTube. Okay, cool. So Periscope, not yet reporting in, but uh, hopefully shortly, uh, because that, this is fantastic. Okay, great. So hopefully we are broadcasting everywhere. Uh, and of course, there we go. We sure do have some Periscope. Fabulous. So glad y'all could join me. And of course, thank you, Instagram. If you want to uh, watch on, if you are watching on replay, please make sure if you want to participate that you come over to the Facebook page where the uh, comments will remain open on the replay. And we will be able to have conversations about all the topics of the SMFA experience that we are doing all the self-management for actors goodness for these 20 days in May. Which 20 days? Oh my God, I'm so glad you asked. There is a calendar available for you right here. There's the link, link in bio at Instagram. It's bonniegillespie.com slash 20. This is the link that will take you to um, our schedule our replay playlist thingy over at the YouTubes, and also a scholarship entry form if you are interested in entering the scholarship for our live round of the 100-day membership program, Getting Gear for the Next Tier. We do a live round for summer school. It is amazing, and you can be scholarshiped in uh, if you enter and dazzle us with your entry. So all the information is there, uh, as well as a way to sign up to get emails so that you will not miss a single broadcast uh, or a replay because we will be in your inbox to let you know that all that goodness is coming your way. So today, we are going to continue to build on the foundation that we started with day one where we established your true north. Remember that? Go back and watch that replay if you missed it because it is the cornerstone to everything else that we're doing this entire time. We are then... Of course, launching at 85%, we're not waiting for shit to be perfect. We are getting stuff out there and then rearranging things as necessary because if we are waiting for things to be perfect to get them out into the world, we're never going to get them out into the world. And so let's not waste time. Let's get stuff out and then edit. Okay? That is the important thing that we learned from day two, launch at 85%. In day three, we talked about doing some data gathering. I gave you some big homework and then a couple days to get it all done so that you could get words flowing in about your most castable type and brand. We talked about your brand umbrella and what role that plays in all the types that you can be cast to play in all the stories that you were born to tell and all the things that are on the road to your true north. And of course, the importance of saying no to all the things that are not on that road. In our most recent broadcast, we talked about how to get the best headshots of your life using that data about how you present in the room, how casting sees you, how the buyers are interpreting you and your vibe. And we then use that information to either go back to old headshots that you previously shot and didn't choose to find the one that best represents you so that you are selling yourself, marketing yourself correctly for what's going to come into the room. Uh, or if you are in need of new headshots, you're able to go make that happen now armed with all the type words and brand words and vibe words and essence words that help you nail how you should be cast next in order to head up the road to your true north, the stories that you were born to tell. So today, day five of your SMFA training for SMF May, the month of May, is all about your resume. So take a moment. Grab your resume. If you uh, are watching in replay, hit pause, go grab your resume and a pen. It don't have to be a red pen, but that's what I got. We're going to go through and we're going to kill off some babies. And I know it hurts. I know it's painful. I know the idea 
of losing some of those credits and slashing things that you did from your resume can feel really troubling, especially if you're already light on credits because you may feel like I have to list everything I've ever done. It's the only way I can prove to buyers that I deserve to be on a set. I need to prove that I'm low risk. I have to show that I know how to act on a set. It's important to list every single credit. Here's the mindset shift I'm gonna ask of you right now when it comes to a resume. Your resume is not a list of everything you've ever done. Your resume is the recipe for how to cast you next. I will say that again. Your resume is not a list of everything you've ever done. Your resume is a recipe for how to cast you next. It is incredibly important that you only put the right ingredients in this recipe. Because if you overcrowd the recipe for how to cast you next with all the ingredients of every time you've ever been cast, you confuse the cook, you confuse the buyer, you confuse your audience, you confuse your fan base. You give me this list of every ingredient in the kitchen and then ask me to figure out what kind of dish you are. And it doesn't work like that. You need to lead me to understand exactly where you're headed next. And your resume is a marketing tool. Your resume is a marketing tool. Your resume is a marketing tool. It is so important that you use your resume to lead me where you want my mind to go about you. And if your resume is filled with low budget projects, no budget projects, things that never actually made it. Like how many of you have things on your resume that you're like, well, I got cast in that and then it didn't shoot or it shot, but it never made it out of post. The financing fell away. So it never actually saw the light of day. It's, it, it, it's not out there in the world, but I did the work. If you have that kind of credit on your resume, what you're teaching the buyer is I say yes to shit that doesn't go. You're letting me know you got a bad picker. So I'm gonna give you an example from my real life because it's easier to see in somebody else's life and hopefully a little funny, uh, even though it wasn't funny to me, it was actually kind of painful. Um, I, as a casting director, got a manager who years ago, many years ago. I had just cast a feature film uh, in, you know, I had had a year in which I cast a half dozen feature films. Like it was a very busy casting year for me. And in one film in particular, we had done some really aggressive high end casting. I had spent a lot of time dealing with this one manager in particular, uh, to get his name actor clients, uh, taking meetings for this project and some of his uh, developmental clients taking uh, auditions. And so we, we had just been back and forth and had a really great, shorthand with one another, great chemistry. He took me out for lunch while everybody was away for the pre-pilot season, dead season. And I remember when he took me to lunch, I was just like, okay, this is typical. You know, agents, managers take casting directors to lunch all the time. It's just to, you know, I'm going to pitch you my clients in exchange for buying you this food. And you're going to tell me about the projects that you've got coming up. And it's just a, a relationship builder. But we never kind of got around to that stuff. And I was like, okay, well, he knows I'm married. So he's not like taking me on a date and he's not doing the usual pitch thing. What's going on? And at this point, he said, I'd like to rep you. And I was like, oh, <laughs> cool. I didn't know that casting directors had reps and apparently at some stage they do. So I ended up signing on with him to be my, at the time, agent. And then he left the agency and went out on his own and started a management firm. And I stayed with him rather than staying with the agency. All this to say, one of the first things that we did was take a look at my casting resume. And I think at this point I had been casting for three or four years, uh, you know, it was, it was still pretty new. Uh, and I had every project I had ever cast on my casting resume because frankly, my enoughness was pretty low as a casting director. I specialized in low budget indies. I worked on projects that were itty bitty budget. I got to work with a ton of directors on like their first big project, um, which big meant 
you know, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars, maybe a couple million dollars, but rarely anything higher than five million dollar budget. So like as far as filmmaking is concerned, these were micro budget indies. Um, and I had at that point never cast anything that was going through a major studio. And so I kept every project on my casting resume, even the ones that didn't go, because I was like, the casting was still done. I don't care that they never shot this. I don't care that it never made it to IMDb. I don't care that it never went on the festival circuit. I did my job as a casting director. Therefore, I'm putting that on my resume. And he said, Bonnie, here's the problem. You've got a project like at the time, I think my highest uh, cred credit was another Harvest Moon. He's like, you've got a project here that was a $600,000 budget film where you have Oscar winners, Emmy winners, Golden Globe winners, Tony winners. Like you, you have an amazing cast of name actors that you got on a tiny budget indie film. And you are distracting me from that big credit because you also have on this same resume, Death by Beaver. I'll give you a second to let that sink in. I cast a film called Death by Beaver. Not porno. It was an actual beaver that went on a murderous rampage and killed the people. Death by Beaver. Casting by Bonnie Gillespie. You're welcome. This project never saw the light of day. But I kept it on my resume because I held auditions. I put out a breakdown. I made offers, negotiated contracts with agents. We got name actors. We, I cast my ass off. So this project was going to stay on my resume. And it took my agent turned manager to wake me up to the fact that I am lowering the value of a good credit by keeping a shitty credit on the same page with it. And I went, all right, got it. It's time to do some resume feng shui. We're going to have to kill off some babies. We're going to have to let go of the fact that I did work and instead turn my resume into the marketing tool that it's meant to be. It needs to show people when I cast, it may not be that often, but I'm able to get Oscar winners and Golden Globe winners and Tony winners and Emmy winners to say yes to first time directors working on tiny budgets because I am so picky about the scripts that I work on. And of course, Death by Beaver doesn't say, boy, is she good with her scripts? Let it, no, not at all. Because even if you wanted to check that, you couldn't because the project just never went anywhere. Okay, so here's what I'm going to ask. I want you to go through your resume today and interview your bookings. I want you to essentially go through every booking that you currently have listed on your resume and ask that booking, is this something I would say yes to again if the opportunity were to show up today? And if the answer is, I, I wouldn't, like this was pre-union and now I'm in the union, or this was so low budget and I would never work on such a low budget project anymore, or this was uh, an unsafe set and knowing what I know now, I wouldn't put myself in those conditions. Can you start to see that there are things on your resume that may be teaching the buyer about who you were? rather than where you're going. And, and I understand that the resume is meant to inform us about your body of work, but is there a way that you can inform us about your body of work from a position of enoughness, from a position of power, from a position of, and here's where I'm headed, rather than, gosh, I hope you think I know what I'm doing, so let me keep proving I've been on a set. Because honestly, the only thing you ever need on a resume to prove you've been on a set is one credit. Once you've been on one set, it, it, it's kind of like losing your virginity. You don't need to prove you're hoary to prove you've had sex. One time is all it takes for that box to be checked. Great, I've been on a set. I didn't get fired. This project made it onto IMDb, this project went on the festival circuit, this project 
starred someone you know, this project is fantastic on my demo reel, but know that you may have something that is fantastic on your resume and not great on your demo reel. And that's okay because not all credits are created equal. Not all credits are meant to serve all the purposes. You may have fantastic stills from a set that show that here you are sharing screen with somebody really amazing and the credit on your resume is so tiny because it was a a, a one-liner, a featured role that maybe it doesn't benefit you on your resume. So I would really like you to Pay attention to what you're communicating to the buyers with your credits. And interview, interviewing your bookings is a really great way to do that. Now, other advice that I want to give on resume, and a lot of this you can get to if you just Google Bonnie Gillespie resume. Okay, like seriously right there. There's resume feng shui, which is uh, one of my most popular pieces on how to wrangle your resume. There's also an article that I've written on billing that if you just put in Bonnie Gillespie billing in Google, you'll land on it. Uh, that's where I go through and explain all the types of billing that can be used on a resume and when to use which one. Because there's some billing that you may think you understand, but that's not how the buyers speak about that size role. And you don't need to keep up with information that IMDb keeps up for us. You never need to indicate that a film that you did was a short. IMDb covers that. You don't need to do that on your resume. Again, your resume is a marketing tool. So you need to let me know that you had a supporting role in an indie film, the director was so-and-so, and if you're like, nobody knows who that director is, okay, great, did it get distribution? Put the distribution entity in your third column. That third column is a really powerful place for you to handle some spin when it comes to your resume. And if right now you're listening to this going, third column, I'm so lost, I don't even have my first resume, good news, put into Google Bonnie Gillespie resume template and I've got your templates for you. I have created templates for you for a starter resume, for a working actor resume, which is when you are actually up and running as a working actor and don't need to try and prove much because you, your body of work is starting to speak for itself. Uh, and then I've got a third level one, which is the name actor resume template, which I don't expect that a name actor is going to come use this template because by the time you're a name actor, you got people handling all your stuff. So that's that's kind of beside the point. The reason I offer that template is so that you from your current position can see the difference in a resume at these three different stages of an actor's career. Uh, and I think it's really important for you to have a good starting point for how you uh, share your marketing materials, which is what a resume is. If you're watching this on Facebook, there is a link that has just been placed in the comments uh, uh, from, thank you, wonderful Aaron and my team. Y'all are fantastic dropping in the links right there in the comments uh, for how to get, it, get information on the uh, starter resume templates, the billing article, Resume Feng Shui, all of those links are scattered throughout the comments here in the Facebook replay version. So make sure that if you're watching anywhere else, you head over there to click on those links. But Google will help you as well. Googling Bonnie Gillespie and the word resume is going to land you on a lot of stuff already. But I want to make sure that we uh, reserve some time for some questions. So let me do a quick check of what might be going on over here. Uh, Stephanie is asking a question for multi-hyphen. It's this question's coming in from Facebook, y'all. Even though I tailor resumes to submissions, my actor's access resume keeps a couple credits from each of my hyphenate offerings. Theory being they can see I'm an actor who can also dance or sing. If they pass that, uh, oops, if they pass the hell yes test, do they stay even though they aren't all of one craft? Or are they better to keep in the special skills for in-person elaborating? Stephanie, the thing with things going into the special skills section and saving uh, that, that opportunity for in-person elaborating is that in-person elaborating is where you control the spin. You can control the trajectory of that conversation when that's where it lives. Once you move it up into the primary territory of your marketing tool, you no longer dictate what the buyer brain is going to do with that information. And so it's up to you to recalibrate your marketing tools based on your goals, your tier, the progress that you've had since the last time you recalibrated your tools. That's, guys, really important with this. Your marketing tools as an actor, a storyteller, or anything else are not static documents. These are not 
one and done, like, oh, dismount. My website is finished. Yay. No, it's not. Okay. I finally, finally got my bio right. I never have to deal with it again. No, y'all, these are living, breathing marketing tools that need to be revisited, recalibrated, retouched, refined, and sometimes completely scrapped and started all over again. Because you are growing as an artist and your goals are growing and you are heading farther up the path to your true north. And so as you continue to have progress, your marketing tools need to continue to be massaged to work in that new direction with those new buyers at that new tier, really demonstrating your new levels. So this is uh, one of those, it depends, Stephanie, if you are at a position where truly all all of those hyphenated areas in your life need that equal bandwidth, go for it. Put them all right up there. But if you're at a point where actually no, the acting is really taking off, I'm starting to get uh, beyond co-star and move to guest star. I'm starting to get brought in on $10,000 uh, four day weeks rather than a thousand dollar day. Like then you may actually be diluting things by keeping the singing and the dancing up there along with the acting credits. But again, that's going to be case by case. And if we were working together privately, we would go into a whole lot more detail on your goals and what exactly your resume is saying. But in general, that's the advice on that. Uh, April says also at Facebook, if you don't have a lot of good, if you don't have a lot of credits, is it good enough to show that you are or have recently studied with great acting teachers? Yeah, your training actually does uh, have uh, have weight especially in certain markets. And there are certain uh, instructors who are considered marquee coaches and their names carry weight when you don't have a lot of credits. There are certain programs and conservatories that also fit into this territory, but definitely in LA, New York, London, there are key instructors that their names being on your resume uh, actually help you because as buyers, we know what that training looks like. We know how it manifests. I, I know if I bring in somebody who's trained at Leslie Kahn and specifically with Leslie at Leslie Kahn, I know what level of commitment that person is going to have for breaking down a script. I know they're going to be able to handle comedy. I know that they um, are going to understand the, the utility player role of a co-star and they're not going to try and make it something bigger than it may uh, may need to be for the purpose of that script. And so there's certain shorthand that exists just by having certain names on your resume. So uh, very definitely, I, I would say the coaches uh, and, and the conservatory training or programs that you've been through can uh, have weight on your resume uh, if you don't yet have a lot of credits. Jimmy asked over at YouTube, if we only have a couple supporting credits in low budget short and background work on IMDb. First of all, your background work should never be on IMDb. So if you're adding that on your own, stop doing that. And if they're adding it, tell them not to um, because the uncredited background work on IMDb does not help you. It actually um, weights your, your IMDb presence uh, in a more negative light with buyers. So be careful. Um, would it be better to have no credits on the resume and just have the starter template with special skills? Um, well, the low budget shorts, Jimmy, those are, those are good credits. You know, the, the fact that you've done something, you've been on a set with any kind of budget, uh, does have weight. And so, you know, if the project never went anywhere and it doesn't have an IMDb page, it never went to festivals, there's no footage from it, then having it on a resume, yeah, that can start to beg questions like, well, so, you know, what, what did this, this credit align with? Like, I see this credit on your resume and I don't see any footage out there that matches it, or I don't see an IMDb credit that matches it. But honestly, if it is truly a starter resume where you are at the beginning of your game and you're not looking to play the lead in a series, you're looking to get those first co-star one-liners, like just, hey, can I get that first experience on a professional set? We're not looking for you to have more ambitious looking credits than that. So you don't need to worry about it looking sparse because part of the reason that those one liners are so important to fill with people who are ready to do one liners is because once you've done a ton of work, you don't want to do a one liner anymore. And so you need to make sure that your resume looks like you're available for the kind of work that you're ready to say yes to next. You're going to do some resume scrub scrub says Nadine. I know. And it, believe me, it hurts. 
it hurts my heart to kill off things from my resume because I remember everything about that job. I remember the promise of saying yes. I remember negotiating the contract. I remember getting paid to do it. I remember it got me my union eligibility. I remember falling in love with a co-star on that set. Like I remember all the things that were amazing about that project. And so it is really challenging to then say goodbye to it on a resume. But this is where you have to trust it has value elsewhere. It has value on IMDb, or it has value on your demo reel, or it has value with the stills that are in your photo gallery on your website, which we, another day of SMF May, we will be talking about your website and your web presence in general. Um, so we will definitely get into that. But there are other places where it may hold more weight than it does on your resume. And just like walking into somebody's home when it's cluttered feels constricting. Um, if you've ever seen those, those staging shows or those home makeover shows where they go in and just take out all the, the shit and make the house staged for purchase, like you can see the difference between a cluttered home and a home that is staged for purchase. Your resume is very similar. If it's cluttered, it feels like it's trying too hard. It feels like you have low enoughness where your acting is concerned. And if instead you're like, look, I'm new, but I'm well-trained, I got some special skills, and I did do this one project that if you want to check it out, it's out there. And that level of enoughness tells me you're not going to be trying too hard on my set. That level of enoughness tells me I can take a risk on you and you're probably going to show me that you're ready to add more things to your resume. But if it's overcrowded with a bunch of shit that I've never heard of, will never see, have never seen, nobody's ever going to see, it's embarrassing to even talk about, why would you keep it on your resume? It's just trying too hard and that feels that way on the receiving end. All right, Jess says, nice to see your face. This is over at Facebook. Thank you, Jess. A uh, question that's not about my resume. How important are slate shots? Uh, they're actor busy work. They're actor busy work. Is it true that I won't be seen at all on Actors Access if I don't have them up? No, fiction, false. Even the people at Actors Access will tell you that that is fiction. Um, if you go into, Jess, go into the Self-Management for Actors Facebook group and just put in uh, slate shots in the search. We have a bajillion conversations that have taken place over the years, including uh, people from Breakdown Services coming in and, and saying, yes, this part is a myth. Yes, this part is actually true. Uh, it's it's all covered there. So, But also think about that. If you believe that um, that having a, a talking headshot gives you an advantage, then do it. Like invest in whatever it is you feel gives you an advantage. But if the reason you're asking is because you go, that doesn't feel like it would give me an advantage. I mean, we'll honor that. Honor that. Jamie Lee wants to know, is it ever beneficial to put a stand-in experience on your resume? If it was for a major star for multiple days on a major film, credited in IMDb as such, but should it be special skills or should I kill this baby? All right, Jamie, here's the question. And then we're going to wrap because I promised I'm keeping these to 30 minutes. So this will be the last question. Uh, I will go back through at Facebook and uh, answer because I see there's a ton of questions here. I will go back and, and answer in the comments uh, some more of these questions. But real quick, let me put up the URL. Link in bio for Instagram. BonnieGillespie.com slash 20 is the place to go to get signed up for alerts when we're going live. We will be doing this again in another couple of days. I'm going to be getting into your footage and your web presence and your bio and your log line and how to take meetings with agents. And oh my gosh, there's still so much to cover in SMF May. Uh, so make sure that you visit there as soon as possible. But let's get back to Jamie Lee's question about the stand-in work. All right. The question to ask yourself. Miss Jamie Lee, is, do I want to be cast again doing stand-in work? Because stand-in is a completely separate department from acting work. It is budgeted in a different department. It is hired by a different division. It is completely separate as far as casting is concerned. So what you show me when you list that you've done stand-in work is that you are a really good person to have on set, that they love hanging with you, that they know that you're reliable and you can hit your mark and you can be where you say you're going to be and all the things that are important about being a stand-in. But you're not booking acting work as a stand-in. 
almost ever. So the, the, the caution there is if it is high profile enough, you then get identified as, oh, she's so and so stand in. And while that's great from a professionalism standpoint, I don't know how great that is from an actor branding position. And so I, I like this being in the special skills area or putting it in the cover letter. Oh, and cover letters we're also going to cover as a part of SMFMA. So make sure you're tuned in for this bunch of free training. And yeah, and Freddie's got it. He's bringing this up over in, uh, in YouTube. Like, where does this fall with, with your North Star in mind? That, that true North. Like that, that position, does it have more stand in work on the path? Like, is the the place where you're headed for the stories that you were born to tell, the reason you were put on this earth as a storyteller, does this path have more stand-in work on it? Or was stand-in work a really great way to make your insurance, uh, to, to be able to earn a living on a set, which is fantastic, to build these relationships, to connect with these buyers, yes, to have an amazing experience all the way around, but it doesn't necessarily inform that true north. That's the question to ask yourself. And by putting it in your special skills or in your cover letter, you control the context. You get to bring it up in a meeting. You get to talk about it with the buyer in a way that couches it from a position of power. If you lead off with it as a credit, we go, oh, this is a career stand-in, and that's what she wants to do more of. So here's the last question I would ask you to ask yourself about every credit in your resume. If this credit answers the question, do I want to do this again? With a yes, keep it there. But if the credit answers the question, do I want to do this again? With a not really, consider losing it from your resume. Consider doing a little resume feng shui. Reorganize, declutter. If it doesn't spark joy, fold it into thirds and Thank it for being there and Marie Kondo, that shit. Something to think about. All right, you beautiful people. We've gone over the half hour mark. Thank you so much for joining me for day five, five of SMF May. We're going to do it again. The next broadcast, I believe, is Friday. It is indeed. It is Friday. All right. So I look forward to seeing your before and after resumes. We've got a lot of people posting in the Facebook group. If you're not a member, come on over to the Self-Management for Actors Facebook group, where we are continuing to drill down on this homework. Uh, and until next time, you beautiful people, stay ninja. Mwah. Thanks for joining me. Bye.